In today's episode, we're talking about a case of motherhood, love, and loss, but not the kind of loss you're thinking about. It's the devious and nefarious case of Susan Smith, right now on Love and Murder. Welcome everyone, welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong. I am your host Kai, and this show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery, suspense, and just a little bit of humor sprinkled on top, but never at the expense of the victim. Be sure to subscribe to Love & Murder on whatever platform you're on, as well as give a five-star review right now so you don't forget. If you're new here, then listen to the episode first, and then please leave a review. Also, welcome! In today's episode, we're talking the case of Susan Smith, a case in which I came to realize that some people really don't need to have kids. But first... I want to remind you to head on over to our Patreon group where we have a ton of bonuses just waiting for you. We have cases which made me so angry and I didn't hide it while recording either. Serial killers and our last episode was an interview with a pedophile. That's one of the cases that pissed me off. Coming up tomorrow is a case of a little old lady who couldn't let her man go. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Come on and join us today. We'll talk more about Patreon later on. Now, on to the show. Susan Leigh Vaughn was born on September 26, 1971 in Union, South Carolina. She was born to parents Linda Sue Harrison and Harry Ray Vaughn. Now, I do know that she has two older brothers, but I couldn't find their names at all. So basically, it was three children. She was the only girl and she was the youngest. So you would think she was spoiled, but I didn't see anything that where it mentioned that she was ever spoiled. Her parents, unfortunately, divorced when she was only seven years old. And a couple weeks after that happened, her father committed suicide. After that happened, the family kind of was like never the same because obviously it was with her, with the children, that's two tragedies back to back. Parents getting divorced, you know, probably their parents moving out of the home. Because sometimes when parents divorce, they do stay in the same places. But, you know, this in this situation, the parent could have moved out of the home. And then right after that, her father took his own life. So you can imagine that she became a very depressed child. When Susan was 13 years old, she tried to commit suicide, but she failed. And instead of taking her to get help, find out what's going on with her, give her a more stable childhood. You know what? Let me not try and shame her because I don't know what her mother did. But her mother then went ahead and got married to a wealthy man she met at a local Christian coalition. And his name was Beverly Russell. Beverly was not only rich, but he was a prominent and well-respected member of the community as well. Now, For Susan, in high school, she was very popular. She did well in all of her classes and participated in a lot of extracurricular activities. She had a lot of friends and was described as fun-loving and extroverted and, you know, that kind of person who everyone loves, has a lot of friends, always doing something. Everybody wants to be around her or wants to be around them. In her senior year, she actually got an award for, quote, friendliest female. Even though on the outside it looked like Susan was doing really well in life, in 1989, when Susan graduated from high school, she tried to commit suicide once again. The reason why she did this was that she was actually in a relationship which, well, on her part it was a relationship, but on the guy's part it was an affair because he was a married man. So I think she ended up getting into this relationship with a married man, probably because she was looking for a replacement for her dad. So I think this could be the psyche as to why she ended up getting into a relationship with a married man, just looking for love. So this married man, as they usually do, ended the affair because he didn't want to lose his wife, his family, everything like that. And this was more than Susan could handle. After this, 
Susan started dating a guy she'd gone to high school with. David Smith had graduated high school with Susan, and he actually started working at the same store she was working at. So they got together, and during their relationship, obviously, they fell in love. In March of 1999, Susan and David got married and ended up moving into David's house. Now, David actually had two children already from a previous relationship, so he was dealing with that at the time. And a few years before they had moved into the house, David's older brother had died. And he and his parents were dealing with that too. So David actually had a lot going on at the time. Now, soon after David and Susan moved into the house, David's father attempted suicide. And this is definitely not what Susan should have been around. David's mother couldn't take everything that was going on. And, you know, I can't really blame her for that. And she just ended up picking up and moving to another city. And after a while, it was just Susan and David in the house alone. However, they wouldn't be alone for long because in October of 91, they had their first child. Instead of bringing them closer, as it would for any other couple, the baby actually made a rift between them. Now, you know what people always say, if you're already having problems in your relationship, don't bring a baby into it. And unfortunately for them, that's exactly what happened. At this time, they had very little money. So Susan would often ask her mom to help her out with money and everything like that. And David did not like this because he did not like Susan's mother. By early 92, the marriage had actually started falling apart. And later on in that year, the couple had actually separated. During this separation, Susan started dating other men, and by late 92, she was pregnant with her next child. Instead of this making Susan and David hate each other even more, this actually allowed them to come back together as a family. They didn't hate each other anymore, and they, you know, stopped thinking about the issues that they were going through and everything like that, and they reunited as a family. However, during this time, they did continue to date other people. But they didn't let this affect their children, affect their relationship, relationship in terms of co-parenting. And, you know, they were still both really loving to their children. After some time, Susan started at a new job as a bookkeeper. And at this job, she started having a relationship with another guy named Tom Finley. Tom was actually a good looking guy and the most eligible bachelor at the company. Susan was very happy that she landed him and really thought that this would be the person she would be with. This was her person. However, Tom, on the other hand, wasn't looking to be tied down and did not want the responsibility of someone who already had their own kids. He didn't have children of his own at the time, and he didn't want a ready-made family. Tom also made it known that You know, he didn't like the differences in their background. He didn't like how Susan was, how she acted towards other men. So he believed that her actions towards other men didn't fit in with what he thought a woman should act like. So what he thought she she should be like in a relationship, what he was looking for in a woman in a relationship. This is what he thought. So after a while, he told her, you know, we got to break up. We got to go our own separate ways. And in October of 94, he actually sent her a letter, which folks, we call this a Dear John letter, explaining all of this to her. So she wasn't left wondering why he didn't want to be with her. And this made Susan feel so alone. And actually later on, she said, quote, she never felt so alone in her life. As time went on, Susan actually started building this unhealthy obsession over Tom. And she decided that she would tell him some secrets of her background, of her childhood and everything. Now, remember I told you that her mom had married a man named Beverly? Well, when Susan turned 16, her stepfather had started molesting her. And he continued molesting her all the way through high school and even after she graduated. So remember we were talking about how she tried to commit suicide uh, right after she graduated. So she was actually with the married man and she was and her fa- stepfather was molesting her. And then the married man decided to, you know, break up with her. 
And she still has this guy molesting her. So she, instead of it being that she was looking for a father figure, which she still was, she probably was still looking for somebody to protect her. The protection to get away from this monster at her house. So all of that's going on. And then the guy that she hoped would be her protection breaks up with her. So this is what led to her trying to commit suicide after high school. And she also told Tom that she did tell her mother. She she relayed to her mother that this was doing this was going on in the household, but her mother didn't believe her and said, you know, she was making up stories. I don't be, I don't understand people like that. I, I really unless you know like it's clinically provable, proven that your child is a pathological liar. I just don't understand parents like that who don't believe their kids when they're telling them this. And then remember, David actually doesn't like her mother. And this is probably the reason he doesn't like her mother. So anyway, she told him about the sexual assault. And by this time, the way she explained it to him was it was an ongoing sexual affair with her stepfather. So I don't know if it was still happening all the way down in 1994, but I know it was still happening like right after she graduated high school and she was with that married man. I couldn't really find information on this, so it would be shocking if it was still happening in 94. And so she told him about her stepfather and she told him that she was also with back with David even though they are seeing other people, she was still with David. They ha- they were having like this on and off relationship trying to make their family work. Then she revealed one final shock, one final piece of just jaw dropping information to Tom. You know what time it is. Cliffhanger Kai's back to give you your weekly reminder to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And you know we will be grateful if you would leave us a five-star review on the platform of your choice. Also, come on over and join us at our exclusive LAM community at Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Once you become a subscriber, you get access to commercial-free episodes so you don't have to hear this interruption ever again. Crazy Crime Corner, Love Obsessions, Serial Killer Corner, Getting to Know the Hosts, Behind the Scene, True Crime Games, and so much more. We have so much fun over there, so come on and join us, starting at only $1 a month. But our most popular tier is the No Murder tier at only $5 a month. Don't miss out, www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, we'll give you five seconds to subscribe so you don't miss out on new episodes over there. You know how much we like the fifth. One, two, three, four, fifth. And now back to the show. Because she wants, she loved him so much and she wanted them to work out. She figured she should tell him the complete and utter truth. So she opened her mouth and she told Tom that she was actually having a sexual relationship with his father at the same time. And of course, I don't know what she thought was going to happen. Maybe she thought Tom was going to be like, oh, you're so open with me. I really love you. Let's just stay together. I don't know what she thought was going to happen, but this devastated Tom, devastated. And he ended up ending things with her. So relationship over. I can't believe you slept with my father. You know, what the F and all that jazz that you would actually say if you found out somebody was sleeping with your parent. I don't think I would say words. We would fight. I don't I don't care what anybody thinks. I, I totally would. So after this, of course, this made her go down into a deep state of depression and she kept calling Tom, trying to get him to come back to her and Tom wouldn't answer the phone or if he answered the phone, he would immediately hang up. He wouldn't like, he didn't want to talk to her. And I mean, would you, if you found out somebody you knew was sleeping with your parent or somebody you were with? Or somebody was who was claiming to be with you and wanted to be like stay with you, 
would you have continued the relationship with them? I, I, I couldn't even look at these people. On the evening of October 25th, 1994, a knock landed on a door. Just, they weren't expecting anyone, just a knock landed on the door. They opened the door and there was Susan Smith just looking bewildered. He told the couple that her children had been in a car and somebody stole the car. So of course the couple called the cops. So when the cops came, Susan reported to them that she had been carjacked and the man had, instead of looking in the back of the car and taking the babies out or anything, he just drove away with the, he just drove away with the children. When the police asked her to give them a description, he, she said it had been a black man. Police started an investigation, obviously just trying to find this ba- these babies before it's too late. Susan went on TV pleading with this guy to bring her kids back. Please, for nine days she would do this. Please bring my children back. However, even though they, they had the best and brightest on this case, and it was a nationwide search, countless police hours, countless jurisdictions, everything, the nationwide search, Police couldn't find these children. So they brought Susan in because, first of all, to them, her story wasn't really making sense, but they're not going to waste time trying to sort through her story because, you know, they're on a time frame to help the children. So even her friends and people who just knew her, like acquaintances and stuff, even they didn't, they weren't... (sighs) They didn't want to say they weren't buying it. So I don't want to say they weren't buying it. It was just a lot of things seemed off. So even with Susan's story, for instance, authorities noticed that there were too many questions. There were too many differences. And each time she was asked about the story, she changed her story. Like it changed every single time. So the authorities decided to, you know, just just off a of routine, give her a polygraph test. And they all came back inconclusive. And another thing that was weird is her friends noticed that she just kept asking if Tom would be coming to see her, which your kids are missing. Who cares if Tom is going to come and see you? Like, are you serious right now? So while all this is going on, you know, she's being scrutinized by the media. She's being scrutinized by her friends. She's being scrutinized by the police. And after nine days of this intense scrutiny, one day Susan just comes out to the cops. So she came out with this story. On the night of October 25th, she had driven down the road with her two sons in the back seat. While she was driving, she was just thinking about everything that was going on in her life and just, you know, she started feeling lonely as she's prone to. And then she went back into feeling suicidal again, as she's prone to. And so she decided to take her lonely feelings and her suicidal feelings and drive her car with her kids in it into the John D. Lake. Now, she says she originally planned to go into the lake with the car because, you know, she was feeling suicidal. But then I guess as soon as the cold water touched her toes, her little toes, her little piggies, as soon as the cold water touched her, she was like, oh my God, what am I doing? And jumped out the car, ran to safety and watched as her car and her children rolled into the water. She ended up giving the police the location of the car and scuba divers went in and they did find the car and they found the bodies of her two young sons. So of course she was arrested and the case went to trial, which I don't know why, because all the proof was there. But you know, the case went to trial in 1995. And at trial, her defense team claimed that she had something called dependent personality disorder and severe depression. And they also said that her need for a stable, uh, a stable relationship with Tom overcame her moral judgment in committing this crime. And according to David Brooke and Judy Clark, who were her lawyers, quote, this is not a case about evil. This is a case about despair and sadness, end quote. Really? I 
I could have swore it was a case about evil. So the defense came out with their own theory about what happened. They said that Susan drove to the edge of the lake to kill herself and her two sons. So basically a murder-suicide. So it was still murder. But, you know, her body wheeled itself out of the car. Like, oh, you can't do this. Get out. And this is, this is what happened. And, you know, feel sorry for her and don't give her a life in prison or whatever. The prosecution, though, said that she murdered her sons in order to start a new life with Tom. So this, this is what the prosecution is saying. Basically, she thought that she would be able to get Tom. Remember, he didn't want a ready-made family. So she thought, well, if I don't have my children, then Tom will want me, which that's crazy in itself because what person would want someone who killed their own children unless they were in themselves insane? But anyways, this is what the prosecution is saying that happened. So after the trial, it took the jury only two and a half hours. It would have taken me five minutes while walking to the back room. I'll be signing papers on somebody's back, like, hold still, let me just sign this. <laughs> it would have taken me five minutes. But anyway, it took the jur jury only two and a half hours, which is basically filling out paperwork, to convict her for murdering her sons. During the penalty phase, the prosecution argued passionately in favor of the death sentence. Her defense submitted a psychiatric uh, diagnosis of her dependent personality disorder and major depression. In the end, the jury voted against imposing the death penalty. So she ended up being convicted in July 1995 for the murders and was sentenced to life in prison on two counts of murder. Susan would come out to say, quote, I am sorry for what happened and I know what and I know that I need some help. I felt that I couldn't be a good mom anymore, but I didn't want my children to grow up without a mom. I felt I had to end our lives to protect us from any grief or harm. I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down that ramp into the water without me. I don't think I will ever be able to forgive myself for what I have done. I was in love with someone very much, but he didn't love me and never would. I had a difficult time accepting that, but I had hurt him very much, but I could see why he could never love me. I broke down on Thursday, November 3rd and told Sheriff Howard, Howard Wells the truth. It wasn't easy, but after the truth was out, I felt like the world was lifted off my shoulders, end quote. You can't see it, but I just rolled my eyes. <laughs> So Susan, like I said, was sentenced to life in prison, and she actually went to the Camille Griffin Graham Correctional Institution in Columbia, South Carolina. Even in prison, she was still writing Tom, but obviously Tom wasn't writing her back. She also expressed a heavy sexual appetite while she was in prison and ended up getting in trouble her and the officers for having sex with two correctional officers. So they ended up being charged and she ended up getting in trouble. She was also transferred multiple times throughout the prison sy system due to her, quote, insatiable sexual desire. Even at 50 years old, she started having a long distance relationship with someone, a 40 year old man who lived just outside the state capital of Columbia. This guy, name wasn't given. He works in home construction and has two adult children of his own and is divorced. After he saw a documentary of Susan, he went ahead and wrote to her and they ended up just writing letters all the time. And in the letters, you know, I guess it went from friendly curiosity, or whatever, to uh, romantic. And they would talk about, you know, what the future would hold. And she was very, quote unquote, romantic in it and everything like that. And she always wanted a family. She always wanted her happily ever after, all of this stuff. In one letter, Susan said, quote, I hope I get to see you face to face soon. She said F to F, which is face to face. And she also wrote, quote, I can't believe I could fall for someone I've never met. So with her long distance relationship, she does have a parole hearing coming up in November of 2024, which as of this recording is only in two years. So she hopes that, you know, I guess the parole board will take pity on her and let her out in November so she can go see her man and be happily ever after. And one of her family members said about the par parole hearing that, quote, 
I don't have a problem with her finding happiness by writing a man, but let's not forget what she did. So I hope her happily ever after is happily in jail. And that is the story of Susan Smith. Her two children are dead and she's still chasing after men. I cannot believe that somebody is actually writing her. Like what you saw the news story or you saw the documentary. I'm sorry. You saw the documentary and something within that documentary prompted you to say, Hey, let me reach out to this poor woman because she must be feeling bad for murdering her two children after a man. You have two children of your own. Are you serious right now? And as his children, I would be ashamed that this is my father. But you know, I I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's why his name wasn't given. So what do y'all think? Let me know in the comments below your thoughts on this case. Let me also know what you think about somebody actually being in a relationship with her and guards having sex with her. You know what this woman did and you want to touch her with even an 18 foot pole? Are you serious? Anyways, let me know what you think either in the comments below, or you can go to our website to our SOS system. Now, somebody pointed out that they went to the website and they didn't see the SOS system. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to explain to you where to find it. So if you go to our website, www.murderandlove.com, that's love and murder backwards, murderandlove.com. Right there on the home page, you'll see like a white box with orange writing that says, send a voice message to Love and Murder Podcast. It says also below that, sing like a bird and shoot us an SOS. Right below that, it says start recording. It's a red, it's an orange button that says start recording. You would go ahead and hit start re- start recording and basically follow the prompts there. So it is right there on our home page, right there at the top. Send a voice message to Love and Murder Podcast. And that, folks, is how you send us an SOS. So shoot us an SOS or comment below to let us know about this case. So let us know what you think about this case. And if you like this episode, then head on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and rate us five stars. You can also download Good Pods and rate us there too. You can say whatever you want in the description, but it does help bring us up in the chart so others can find us just like you did. Follow us on social media at facebook.com forward slash relationship crime, Instagram at love murder podcast. Join our Facebook fan page by searching love and murder fan page in Google or Facebook, or by simply clicking in the show notes below. Also, I do have a video in our Facebook fan page of how to get to our SOS. Find our awesome merch by going to our website, www.murderandlove.com and clicking on our shop in the menu above. And an easy and free way to help us out is by simply sharing this episode. Share with your friends, share with your husband, share with your former husband, share with your mom, share, 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 share. And as always, I end each episode by reminding you that it's all love and no murder, y'all. Bye.